Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Trust in God. Trust in God's grace and mercy and guidance, correction and forgiveness and love for the world and for each and every person. Trust in God is our invitation for today. Our story of faith, the Bible, opens with three great words, in the beginning. But some people have heard those words to be four words. In the big inning, it relates maybe to God being a fan of baseball. <laughs> But as the beginning foundation of our faith, the Spirit captures our attention and our imagination as we hear, as we see vivid and illustrious beauty of God, the beauty of God illustrating and fashioning all of creation, including humanity. Oh, humanity, God's crown jewel of creation. Very early in our story of faith, God's prize of creation seems at the same time brilliant and dull or lackluster. With all of its life and death, joy and discovery, sorrow and wars and peace and leaders and followers, wandering and yes, even trust at times. We learn of humanities, our complexities of relationships with each other and with God. And from the beginning of Scripture, we are invited to trust in God, who is, who is with us through it all. And then by the time we get to the final words of the Hebrew Scriptures, the First Testament, or the Old Testament as we commonly say, in the book of Malachi, we wonder if humanity is even going to make it. If God might just throw in the towel and let humanity turn in on itself, causing it to internally combust or wither away with no root or branch. While certainly the end did blooms, God shines a light of hope. In my first confirmation class, someone was saying the book of Malachi, and I was not listening appropriately, and they said, Malachi. <laughs> What's Malachi? Malachi. Malachi, in our very short reading this morning, proclaims that those who trust in God will rise with healing and leap out of confinement as a newborn calf. <clears throat> Any leapers today? Leapers? No leapers. In the remaining verses of Malachi, which we did not read, the Hebrew Scriptures conclude the whole of the Old Testament with two instructions. Remember the teachings of Moses, for in them we learn how to be in relationship with God and the rest of humanity. And secondly, to watch and listen Specifically for Elijah, but we can understand Elijah's presence to be the prophet or the one who directs humanity's attention to God. Remember, watch and listen, for God's promises and God's love will be fulfilled. From the beginning to the end of at least the First Testament, we hear and see the invitation and to believe and have confidence in God, for God is with us through it all. Perhaps it's too simple of a message. God is with us through it all. Trust God. However, when seemingly earth-shattering <coughs> and life-harrowing moments leave us at a loss or confused, we need to hear and see and remember, again, that God loves us, and God loves the world. And oftentimes, God's love breaks us open in perhaps the most unlikely ways. Paying attention 
to the new creation that occurs after the First Testament when God and Jesus comes back to the scene of humanity after some 400 years of God being silent. That's a period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. God then arrives in the cry of a child in a manger. And into people's fears, into people's worries, into their wonders, if God was still alive, God's word cried out, endearing humanity's hearts to love and compassion. Not only for this child, but for the world. And through the cries of teaching about God, through the invitations to follow, through his own healing hands, through life-giving words and commands that guide and forgive, Jesus invites us, along with all of humanity, to trust God's never-failing, unconditional love. So when we hear again, from Luke's perspective, this apocalyptic, end-of-the-world graphic imagery of the destruction of the temple, we might wonder, do I really want to trust in what appears to be a scary and angry God? Reading and hearing Jesus' words from this section of Luke gives me, and perhaps all of us, pause on this Sunday after Election Day in the United States, when we as a country don't seem to be very unified. The results of November 8th might very well appear to be apocalyptic in the eyes of many, with the, exactly the kind of expected aftermath that Jesus describes. Perhaps you saw the photo on Facebook of the church sign, Jesus is coming, hopefully before the election. <laughs> but if you are here this morning, my brothers and sisters, it is likely that the second coming did not happen. We're still here. We are likely trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces after this election cycle that has been contentious at best and at worst has exposed the underbelly of all that we wish we could pretend did not exist in our world. The world, humanity, the rest of humanity sees our disunity, our discord, our dis-ease, and we see it too as arguments and anxieties and tensions and traumas are very real. While there are very many who are glad and looking forward to a new presidency with hopes to shift the political agendas of our nation, more than just a few are living in a mammoth of deep shock, fear, anger, and grief that describes anything but that of the intended life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for all. Perhaps what we have discovered this week again is that we are just like the rest of the world. Just like the rest of humanity, we are broken and in need of God's grace and love and mercy. And as scripture beckons us to seek and trust in God, Caroline Lewis asks the question, where and on what your gaze is fixed on means everything. Where you are fixing your focus means everything. And do you see what and whom Jesus sees? And then she comments, if your eyes are locked only on that which is temporary, you might miss observing the permanency of those things that last. If you only see obvious grandeur and splendor, you may overlook beauty in that which first appeared unattractive, even repulsive. If you focus on only the damaging, the destructive, the deliriousness, you might just miss what is affirming and constructive and thus even encouraging. And she hears Jesus' words like we do. 
As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, and all will be thrown down. So we must ask ourselves, what things do we see? Where is our attention focused? In our churches, in our denominations, in our nation, in our world, in each other? Because what we see is that which we testify to, to what we will give witness. Our witness, we get to it this morning. Our testimony. How do our lives reflect God's unconditional love and deep con concern for us and for others? How do our words and our actions lead others to trust in God? In the reading from 2 Thessalonians, Paul, Paul speaks to the brokenness of their community. In an article this week entitled, Don't Give Up on Doing Good, Frank Crouch writes and asks the question again, what problem is Paul trying to solve that causes him to slap his words so thoroughly to one end of the giving spectrum? Despite the common assumption that he addresses, he addresses the poor people taking advantage of others' generosity. The letter does not say that the problematic people are poor, just that they are idle and busy bodies. Although this could be a group of poor people who are also lazy, Paul does not identify them by economic status. He could also be referring to a group of idle, rich people with resources for doing good, but who spend their time meddling and throwing their weight around because they can. Or he could be referring to formerly wealthy people who gave away resources to the community, but now they are just coasting on that gift, ordering others around while expecting <coughs> now to be supported by the resources that they still consider, in a way, to be their own. Regardless of what behavior existed that Paul described as unwilling to work, he is concerned about its impact on the community and its ministry. Paul describes this problem by reminding them of the example that he himself set, set on how they and how they, the community of Thessalonica, are not following that example. And paraphrasing Paul, we can hear, we weren't idle when we were with you because we didn't have to be. We paid for what we ate because we could. We didn't want to be a burden on anyone because we didn't have to be, we were setting an example of how, if God has given us capability and gifts, we should put them for use for the good of others, for you, all of you, even if we weren't required to. And he concludes, don't get tired of doing what is right. Don't get sick of doing good. Keep on keeping on and doing good things. Never stop lifting up those around you if you can. Don't ever give up on doing good. Do whatever good you can, whenever you can, wherever you can, and in whatever ways you can, even if you don't have to. And as people who trust in God, that trust is revealed through our words and actions and deeds, our attitudes and behaviors. So how are each of us stewarding our trust in God? Perhaps in looking a little closer to home, I hope you are aware, many of you are aware, that our congregation is in the midst of our fall stewardship appeal. Hopefully each of your families has received a stewardship invitation packet. If you have not, they're available at the welcome desk just outside the sanctuary. And now we're thinking how we are gathered together as Salem's people, uh, Jesus' people at Salem. Each of us is being invited to respond to God's generosity, God's trust in us by practicing and living out a daring trust in God 
who provides for each one of us so graciously and abundantly so that the ministry that we share together will thrive, not to make us look good or pat ourselves on the back, but to glorify God. <coughs> and to tie a few of the thoughts together this morning in this message, we hear, trust God. Do whatever you can, even if you don't have to. And your response is part of your witness and your testimony of God at work in you. And I hope you hear the message of stewarding your trust in God. You're invited to return your completed estimate of giving cards and gifts and glory surveys in the basket that's at the front anytime, but especially next Sunday, if you please. So brothers and sisters, in the thick and the mess of it all, God is with us. God is with you through it all. So we pray that God continues to open our eyes and our hearts to see and be the brokenness of the world, including our own, so that we may turn again to Christ and extend holy compassion and love as it has been unconditionally given to us in Jesus. We pray, I pray, that the Holy Spirit fills us this day and always and gives each of us vision and hope to increasingly trust God so that in the midst of discord, solidarity, and togetherness and forgiveness in Christ is the witness that we bear. And as God is gifting you with trust and unconditional love, love big, pray diligently, serve believing that God's work is happening through your hands. Or as the prophet Amos said, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. It's our God in whom we place our trust. And I'd like to us to return again to Psalm 98 to talk about and reflect again and read together as one people of God who God is. So I invite you to read, read together. Let's all read together. Forget about leader and congregation. Read it all together. Sing a new song to the Lord who has done marvelous things, whose right hand